I, I'm sometimes very sympathetic with uh, what Carl von Weizsäcker called Kreisgang. It's a circular yet coherent argumentation. And uh, very often also in the discussion, for example, in the interpretation of quantum mechanics or in the relation between classical and quantum physics, people like to cut the chain and, stay, and, and tell the story, this is the beginning, and there you end. And then there are people who will say, well, quantum fields, this is the most elementary things. And then in some limits of coarse graining uh, observation, we come up to the classical physics. And then there is a Copenhagen maybe, uh, who would like, oh, no, no, I mean, we cannot even say anything without classical apparata. All clicks uh, or all quantum phenomena are just a relation between our classical apparata, preparation and, and the measurement. There is no particle, it's just clicks that I try now to coherently interpret and then I come up with the idea of maybe there is a particle, but there is nothing there, you know, first. And then I felt always that uh, uh, both sides have right in a certain sense. and that we don't need to make this choice. And if, if there is a coherent picture in, in a sense that in, in order to define the state, I cannot define the state without referring to something external, as Renato said, and this external is usually classical and quantum, uh, then that's a part of the, of the story. But this doesn't also prevent me to think about uh, the me measurement apparatus as being built by some maybe particles that have state, and then you can say, but, but which state? But well, state that are defined with respect to the external measurement apparatus. And I'm not, this is a circular reason, reasoning, but it's coherent, and I, I have nothing against that kind of solution. I'm not answering your question uh, directly, but I think that's the analogy that I would like to, with, with which I can live mm. um, as a as a yeah, I get it. and it's but just the image that pops to mind is that you, the U of Wheeler, you're it's the it's you're making the Wheeler, it, you're it's making the same it, but you want to make it circular. You just say I don't want to pick either of one side, and yeah. and do you have anything to add to that, Eric Renato? As sort of a final final thought, I think I I agree with that. Generally, I would say any picture that would just put the observer at the end of a chain would for me be. Um, go in the wrong direction, because I think what we learn is really the observer or the agent plays an extremely important role. So it's not at the end of a chain, it's maybe circular or even, let's say, more involved in the sense that everything is at the end, at any stage relative to that observer. So I think we, sh uh, we should just do physics with, co in a way that takes the idea of observer, agent, dependence, or however one wants to call it, much more seriously than we do it today. Thank That's you. Yeah. And Eric? Yeah, so I think, for example, just to riff a little bit on the Wheeler, uh, you mentioned the, the observer participancy, right? Um, the way that I like to think about what I think Wheeler is, is saying there is something along the lines of, yes, the fact that we're performing an observation now, and the, you know the choices that we make in whether or not to perform an observation, whether or not to open the box and ask the friend, "What, what have you seen? Right? Have you seen a definite outcome?" And then this, the friend comes out and says, "Yeah, it's a hat." Um, that observation that we make now may not only it, it doesn't you don't need to think that it creates uh, those events now, but it also reaches back into the past in some way and makes it real relative to you and to that uh, perspective from which you are observing that event. And so, yeah, the fact that there is an observer at the end obtaining that information and, in, and in, in some sense making it real relative to that observer may not have even created the the observation for the friend that was inside of it. The friend had his own observation, but it's connected to the outside observer now. But it makes part of one coherent history 
that reaches back in past. And I think that the difficulty there is to trying to find a, a language even and trying to make sense of that as being a shared reality, but not in terms that you are literally affecting the past, but in terms that it is the, the, it's coalescing. The, uh, the, 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 the realities become coalesced in, in, a, in a certain sense. Um, but um, yeah, but then I think, yeah, the, the different perspectives are important for each observer, I think, in the sense that if we take seriously that there are these different perspectives, right? I want to believe that there is a, a perspective from the friend inside the box. And um, I want to, to not say that I'm, I'm a, 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 you know, that is only real when it becomes real to me. But, um, but if, but the, the, the fact that there are perspectives to be, to be, uh, to, to be accounted for at all, I think it's, it's an important, in an important part of the problem. Thanks for, for all three of you on reflecting on that question of consciousness. And we recently at our foundation had a conference about time and minds who were reflecting, and that was more about Einstein. And, but of course the difficulty of, um, of how to account for mind in our universe for something which what it is be to like to be in this universe like how philosophers like to put it but then uh, Lee Smolin surprised us in the sense that he also ponders on this and in one of his lectures he accounted uh, tried to come up with a way to account for qualia that's sort of the term it's a more neutral term than consciousness, right? It's just the contents of perception. And yeah, those in those contents, we see a defined states. We never experience, we never see a superposition. So how can we get to this qualia? And in that presentation, he at some moment said, the universe is nothing but a partial, um, uh, the universe is nothing but a collection of partial views upon itself. And that to me was just a very beautiful way to summarize it. And in a way, it feels as if you are in, in the same space in, or as Lee when it comes to that. So it's th these partial views upon itself because it's all part of the universe and that's it. <laughs> I mean, does it resonate with you? Yeah, although I think the consequence of these theorems, if you want to keep locality and so on, would be that the partial views cannot be put together as one God's eye view, that the partial views are in some sense really what incompatible. Yeah, and yeah, it's much more think? fragmented yeah. um, or even incompatible yeah. as a stronger. Um, so somehow it's, this quote sounds like um, a very united picture of reality, even if it is somehow self-reflecting. But there is, at least from these theorems, much more something like fragmented, perspectival. Perspectival. <laughs> I would yeah. not necessarily call it fragmental, because I could also take the viewpoint that, let's suppose that things can really not be put together. So maybe there is nothing to be put together. Maybe there is just my perspective. And... I should just accept that now also maybe coming back to like the question, what is, is consciousness? Still, I don't know what it is, but I could say it's certainly a starting point. It's not something that comes out of the world because I have this perception that's at the very start. That's the most certain thing in the world is that I feel this. It's much more certain than that atoms somewhere out there exist. So for me, this is a starting point. And now maybe we develop this desire to kind of find a common picture, which seems fragmented, but maybe I should just start from there and say, there are these perceptions that I have, and that's how we should start with physics. So it puts me in the center. This sounds now, again, extreme subjective, extremely subjective, but um, I think that's a viewpoint that hasn't been really studied recently, at least. And for me, this is extremely, um, promising at least, or the, the theorems we have, the, the insights point at that this is at least an option. And if you follow this option, all these ideas about like things like our perceptions are emergent from an underlying world would 
just not even um, make sense because one would just start from this as the basic thing and all the rest is... And this is classic Descartes before he turned sort of dualist, right? You say the yes. cogito ergo sum that sort of as a primary mm. thing and it, mm -hmm. which makes me work for our foundation, Essentia Foundation, because idealism, I don't want to commit, I want, cannot say it's true because I have no way to, to prove or falsify it. The only thing I can say, it feels as a very nice working hypothesis to start from and uh, to try and then get to an objective component because I don't want to end up sort of solipsist worldview. And in a sense to thank all of you, what you put in the hard work, if we're trapped in mind or trapped in this universe, you, you guys are really putting in the hard work not to jump to conclusions or weird stories about it, but to be rigorous and just test stuff. And I really appreciate that. I want to congratulate you with your award. And then I hope you enjoy that tomorrow. And thanks so much for this conversation.